let's officially get started. So welcome everybody. We're excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm really excited to guide you through this class today. And I'm really happy that I'm not alone doing it. I'm with one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, Tom Donnelly. Tom Donnelly, you wanna say hi to everybody? Hello everyone. So Tom and I are excited to walk you through these 15 cases. Now these court cases are really important cases and they're a part of the AP government GOPO class that the college board sets out. So we wanna do a review of all the cases, but we also wanna kind of get the big picture idea and expose everybody to why did they pick these cases and then why did they group them together? So there's a lot to go through, but a really kind of fun way to do it. So Tom, I figured we could dive in deep. There's six different sections we're gonna go through. Um, the first section is about federalism. And it has these two cases, McCullough v. Maryland and United States v. Lopez. So here's the big idea. First, the College Board picked these 15 classes to go along with the course and a part of the test that the students take when they, if they choose to when they complete the course. And they want us to really look at important concepts and big ideas. For, so for this first area, of course it's federalism. So Tom, my first question is going to be for you. Define federalism for us. What the heck is it? Let's start there and make sure we all have the same bottom line. And then secondary, you know, when they think about putting these structures together, how is there a balance in power with federalism between the three parts of the national government, but then also between the national government, the state government and the individual? And so these two cases are almost what I like to think of as bookends on this conversation of federalism. It was like the first one and one of the most recent ones. Um, and what do they tell us when they put these together and why did they put these together? So this is our kind of fun um, eight, magic eight ball conversation around these cases. So tell us about federalism and then we'll dive into the cases. Absolutely, so federalism is just this big debate over the powers of the government. And it's the debate over which powers go to the national government and which powers go to the state. So when we created the constitution, we created a more powerful government, national government than we had before, but the state still retained really, really important powers. And so with McCullough and Lopez, as Curry said, I like to think of them as bookends. That's a great way to think of it, Curry, because with McCullough, we begin with John Marshall and the Marshall Court and a pretty broad statement of the powers of Congress. And then with Lopez, it's, in the, it's towards the end of the 20th century and it's the court trying to once again, define limits on the powers of Congress. So let's start with McCullough. McCullough, in many ways, it's a battle between the national government and the state of Maryland. And so it, it involves one of the biggest constitutional issues in early America. It's about the constitutionality of a national bank. And so Congress has just charted a new national bank. And in 1816, the state of Maryland has, has decided we are going to go after this bank. We're going to try to drive it out of the state of Maryland. How are we going to do that? We are going to tax the National Bank in Maryland, and we want to tax it out of existence. And so Maryland comes and they and, and, and so they, they, they pass this law. This law is challenged. And Maryland really makes, you know, one big constitutional argument here. The big constitutional argument is that the bank itself, the bank that was chartered by Congress, this national bank is unconstitutional. What do they say? They say, look at the Constitution. Where does it say that Congress has the power to charter banks? It's not anywhere in there. Congress doesn't have the power, the National Bank is unconstitutional. And with the Supreme Court, with Chief Justice John Marshall, the great Chief Justice writing for the court, what it says is, Maryland, you are wrong. You are wrong for two reasons. One reason is you're not reading the Constitution correctly. When we look at the powers of Congress, they are, Congress, the national government is a government of limited powers. But when we, when we read the powers of Congress, what we have to keep in mind is that they, there is a, a clause in the Constitution called the Necessary and Proper Clause. And what this tells us is that when we read the Constitution, not every single specific, uh, to every detailed power of Congress is going to be written there. And so what we need to be able to do is look at what Congress has done and see whether or not it's related in some reasonable way to a power that is actually written in the Constitution. And what Marshall says is the National Bank uh, meets this test, that under the Necessary and Proper Clause, Congress has the power to charter a bank because it's related to some of Congress's other powers, like taxing and spending for the general welfare. The broad principle here, the big idea, Curry, 
is that the Marshall Court is giving Congress some flexibility to shape policy in ways that go beyond just what's specifically written in the Constitution. The last part is what Marshall says is, by the way, also states, you have to remember that when the national government is acting legitimately, it is supreme. That's what Article 6, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution says. What you're trying to do is use state power to tax this national institution out of existence, but the power to tax is the power to destroy, and so that tax is unconstitutional. And I love the way you said that. When the national government is acting correctly, they have the supremacy over it. So saying, like, would Marshall then imply, like, if it wasn't right, then they don't have supremacy? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So the next case around this is a much more modern case. It's Lopez. And it it looks at guns in school property. But again, getting back to the big idea around supremacy, around the power of Congress and the how the courts define this policy, kind of get to that idea too. What do we take from this Lopez case? Yeah, the, big, the big thing that the Rehnquist court here in Lopez is declaring is the Constitution really does mean it when it says that Congress and the national government have limited powers. And so what the court's trying to do here is we've had decades upon decades of Supreme Court cases seemingly expanding the powers of Congress and of the national government. And what the Rehnquist court here is trying to do is saying, no, there are still limits. And so it's trying to come up with a principle for limiting the power of Congress. And this case here, you're right, it involves a student and a national law called the Gun-Free Schools Act. And this student brought a gun into the school. He was prosecuted under um, that, that, that national law. And what the student argued was that law is unconstitutional. That Congress doesn't have the power to pass laws that are banning guns in schools, that effectively that's not an economic activity. And it's a, it's a quintessentially local thing. We usually think of those sorts of laws shaping schools as something the states and local governments traditionally do. And so therefore this law is exceeding Congress's power. And in a divided decision, five to four, the Supreme Court said, Mr. Lopez, you're right. And precisely for the reasons you're saying, one, this is, the, well, the big idea being, again, that the court is looking to uh, set limits on the powers of Congress. And what the court says here is if you look at this specific law, it's dealing with a non-economic activity and a non-economic activity that's not what they would say technically, quote unquote, substantially related to interstate commerce. Um, that's, that's the technical language. But really what the court's trying to do is to say that Congress, if you want to pass laws that are going to touch on issues that are traditionally handled by the state and local governments and that they are non-economic, you have to have a really, really tight link between that activity and the power that you're using, in this case, the Interstate Commerce Clause. The reason this is important, Curry, again, is that for decades upon decades upon decades, the Supreme Court had basically let Congress pass a wide range of laws under its commerce power. Um, and so this was in 1995, it was from the New Deal in 1937, 1995, Congress was doing that. In 1995, the court's finally saying, no, 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 we're gonna set new limits. Yeah, and that's why I think of these as bookends, not just in time, but, you know, McCullough said, this is what you can do and like open the door. And then Lopez said, okay, we're going to draw a line in the sand here. You can't go past this or you have to have a really good reason. Because at the end of the day, the power is in, for this case, is in that commerce clause. And if you can't make a tight link, then you don't have the power. Um, Very kind of interesting. Now, the next set of cases that we will look at for this are looking at the balance of liberty and order around the Bill of Rights. So I I love this section of uh, the GOPO class, the government and policy class, politics class, because it really looks at what do we mean by having power, that we give power to the government, but at the same time kind of hold on to individual rights. And looking at those two, but not at odds with each other, but in times when they can come into like tension um, and kind of rub past each other in weird ways. So they start with Jefferson's um, Declaration of Independence and we look at it and we look at these ideas that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So help us define that. But then that among them are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, meaning we make governments to ensure that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But hold up, there are some rights that nobody can touch. And so, like, that is my, you know, real quick, down and dirty version of that. So, these 
four cases. I want to walk through each one and show where the tension is between the government and the people, but that's also understand the big idea behind this. So how do you want to start with the case or the big idea? I love both. Well, let's go, let's go through the cases and draw out the big ideas as we go through, I think. So the first case here is Engel versus Vattel, and this is the landmark case addressing school prayer. And so here the, the conflict is between New York State, which has authorized its public schools to recite short voluntary prayers at the beginning of each school day, and parents who are coming in and argue, arguing, no, 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 this violates the First Amendment's establishment clause. And so these two things being in conflict, what the, what the state wants the schools to be able to do, and what parents are saying are violated by the First Amendment's establishment clause. And what the court rules here in a six to one decision is that the parents have it right. The parents have it right. They struck down the New York prayer under the First Amendment. And the court explains state officials, just they don't have the power to compose official state prayers and require that they be read in public schools. Even if those prayers don't say Jesus, don't commit to a particular religion, even if they're very general. And this prayer read, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. So it's very, it's, it's very general, very vague, but the court here is saying, no, that is unconstitutional. That violates the separation of church and state. And what's interesting is that this case results in a big backlash against the Supreme Court. And what we see is the court, as to schools, completely holds its ground, expands angle to the context of prayers at football games, graduation ceremonies, so holds its ground there. But we also see as the court in certain other settings, settings involving adults and the government saying that prayer is often okay, whether it's a prayer at the beginning of a legislative session or a town meeting. And so what's doing a lot of the work here in these cases seems to be the court being concerned about specifically students and children and the powers of the state to use its power to coerce them to believe something that they and their parents don't believe. Oh, and that's so important. And I always think about that with the coach when I see the coach. A coach is a really powerful actor of the state when they're in a public school. And so them telling their students what to believe, you can you the court saw that power dynamic between the youth and the leadership and said, no, that's not the role of government. So I think that's so important, Tom. Thanks for clarifying that. And I also really interesting. And that's around the establishment clause in the First Amendment. Just also like as students go through this and when you look at the exam, you wanna note those words. This is the establishment clause, this is why. Now the next case is looking at the other half of the religious freedom part of the First Amendment, the free exercise clause. And it's looking at a case about Amish students going to being forced by the government to go to school after eighth grade, which was not what their parents wanted. So, so many questions about that. And is there anything really significant about eighth grade? I'll just ask that secondary question. <laughs> yeah, so here the conflict in this case is between the state of Wisconsin, which has a law saying that kids have to go to school for a certain period of time. And then it's Amish families coming in and saying, no, 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 that requirement it, it goes against the tenets of our faith. If our, if our children are in schools past a certain point, past in what they argue is past eighth grade, they're exposed to too many worldly values that conflict with our religion. And furthermore, to be good members of our community, they don't need more than an eighth grade education. Um, and so what they do is they bring this challenge under the free exercise clause. And the Supreme Court ultimately says, in this case, Wisconsin v. Yoder, Amish families, you're right. You're right, you have identified a place in which the free exercise clause can be used to strike down what Wisconsin has done here, because in the end, this does infringe upon your, uh, your religion. And furthermore, the, the government hasn't been able to present a compelling reason, a really, really, really good reason as to why specific in this, why they, they have to allow your children to be in school past eighth grade. And so the thing to note here, Curry, is this is a question that comes up a lot in cases, this question of you have a law that applies to everyone, religious challengers come in and say, no, it violates my religion. It's a free exercise clause violation. And the court has to decide when, when, does, the, when does the government win and when do these re religious challengers win? Yoder's notable because it's one of the few landmark cases where the religious challengers win. Usually the relig religious challengers have lost these cases, but it remains a really, really hotly debated topic in constitutional law and one where we could see the law shift over time. Yeah, and so many follow-up questions, but we'll save them for the next class. <laughs> um, the next, I know we have so many to go through. The next um, case is Tinker v. Des Moines. Um, and what I just want to share with the students, and I'll send it out via email, is Elizabeth Tinker is speaking at a student town hall with us 
on May 1st, which is law day. So if you want to hear about the case from Elizabeth Tinker herself, I will send you out the link. It's free. It's public. It's open to you all. So just wanted to drop that in out there. Um, but really excited to have this kind of amazing primary source, what, you know, come and join us on a conversation on law day. So Tom, tell us about this case. Yeah, so the, the, the conflict here is between the Tinkers and their school, the school being the government. It's a public school, so that's the government body here. And these students here, you can see, they wear these, these black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. The school says, no, no, you have to take those off. You can't bring political protest into the school corridors. The students refuse. They're punished by the school. And the students come in and say, this violates our free speech rights under the First Amendment. Um, and so you have a conflict here between a school trying to advance what they take to be necessary for discipline and for the education of students and for order in their school being pitted against the free speech rights of these students. And the Supreme Court here in a seven to two decision said the students are right. That students, and here's the famous quote, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. And so here, what, they're, what the, what the uh, court's saying is that in this context, it's not enough for the school to predict that there's going to be some disruption to discipline in the school. There's no evidence of that. And so students still have free speech rights. But the flip side is also really, really important. And that's that this court sets up different rules of free speech inside the schools. So students still have free speech rights. But what the court says is that, that uh, schools can end up restricting speech if it is going to materially or substantially interfere with the school's operations. So Tinker stands for the proposition that the school has to really be able to show that that's the case, but it also stands for the proposition that schools do have more power over speech than say my state government does over me if I'm criticizing the government. It's just a different set of rules in one place versus the other. We strike a different balance between freedom and order. Because place matters when we're talking about speech. So I love that, you know, this is political speech, so it's more protected. Um, so it's more protected even in a school setting, but they also have to ensure that there's going to be a disruption to the school. And so that leads us really nicely to the next case. And we can think about disruptions and there has to be a disruption. You can't just stop it before it happens, which our next case talks about prior restraint. So different location, out in the world, different topic, freedom of the press, but it's still talking about you can't stop speech before it happens. There has to be, you know, you can't have that prior restraint. So tell us about the New York Times v. Uh, United States in 1971. What's going on? What, what's the tension? I think this case is fascinating. Yeah, so this is famously known as the Pentagon Papers case. So you may have heard of it uh, under that name. But the conflict here is between the New York Times and the Washington Post, so two leading newspapers, and the Nixon administration. And the, the debate here is uh, over what's technically known as prior restraint. This is sort of the legal term of art, but it's really just a fancy way of describing uh, situations where the government is trying to stop something from being published. So it's the president, that's the, uh, it's in this case, the Nixon administration trying to keep the New York Times and the Washington Post from publishing something about the government. And the Pentagon Papers themselves, this, this, these were papers derived from a secret government report about American activities in Vietnam over the last 22 years. And so someone was able to get access to that report, wound up taking photographs of over 4,000 pages of this report and sent it to the New York Times and it eventually goes to other newspapers. And the Nixon administration says, wait a minute, there are government secrets in there. It endangers national security. Stop the presses. Stop the presses. So they go to the courts and say, no, because of these national security concerns, because these are government secrets, stop the presses. The Times can't publish. The Washington Post can't publish. And this case ends up very quickly getting to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court says is, no, Nixon administration, you're wrong. You are wrong here. If there's one thing that we know about the First Amendment, one of its core principles is that there, we really, 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 really disfavor prior restraints. Prior restraints are almost always almost always unconstitutional under the First Amendment's freedom of the press. If the government wants to keep someone from publishing something, it needs a really, 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 really good reason. And Nixon administration just saying national security, that's not enough. And the thing to realize, Curry, is, is that it's a real conflict. It may very well be the case. There may have been arguments that this could, could uh, 
you know, uh, impinge on government secrets and national security. But the court is saying that, no, no, no. When we are talking about the First Amendment freedom of the press, at the core of it is the ability to criticize government policy and potentially check government abuses. And so because of that, prior restraints almost are, are almost never constitutional. Which I feel like, did the Nixon administration think, like, think they were going to win this one? And like, how do you not like know all these colonial stories and say, this is an area we do not mess with here. We are clear where we stand now, but there, there are limits to speech and to press and to the, all these pieces. There's always limits. I, I love these cases, but I also want to be real clear, like you did with the Tinker case, there are limits like Hazelwood. Um, one of the limits that we talk about in these AP cases is Shank. And I know that you'll probably bring up Brandenburg and that's cool. Uh, you can kind of put those together, but tell us about uh, the limit on free speech around Shank. So yeah, so Shank really is there to emphasize the fact that all of the rights in the Bill of Rights, uh, none of the, basically, no, no right in the Bill of Rights is unlimited. And so there are limits on every right. And this is where we are. We're trying to strike a balance between order and liberty, as the title said. And Shank stands for the proposition that sometimes there are limits on free speech rights. So this case took place during World War I. And so the defendants are charged under the Espionage Act with basically mailing circulars that, were, that the government said were designed to obstruct the military draft. And this ran right up against the Espionage Act. It was illegal under the Espionage Act. And these pamphleteers uh, argued that, well, that law, the Espionage Act, is unconstitutional. It violates our First Amendment right to free speech. Um, and so it must be struck down as unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court here, in a unanimous decision, authored by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, says, no, the government is right here. And this is where Holmes uh, uh, presents the, establishes the very famous clear and present danger test under the First Amendment. And so what this basically says is that, you know, the court, when looking at a, at, at a law passed by government, uh, in a free speech case has to look at it, uh, you know, the, uh, here's the quote. It says, they, they has to ask the question of were the words used, quote, in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to, to, uh, to prevent. And it gives this famous example, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. In many ways, Curry, it seems like the fact that we're in a war context is doing a lot of work here. Um, for, for saying that, you know, Congress here is legislating in a war context to try to protect national security and try to win the war. And that in this context, the, the court seems to say that that's actually permitted under the First Amendment. Now, the thing to note is that over time, Schenck is really the outer, it, it is the broadest statement of the limits of free speech. But over time, the Supreme Court has become more speech protective. And so to, if you were to look at Supreme Court cases running all the way up till today, you would say that free speech in America right now is protected more broadly than it's ever been in American history, and that free speech rights here in the United States are broader than probably anywhere else in the world. The key test is no longer the Schenck test here, but it's a case from a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. And the main test here is that, you know, in the end, uh, the, the question we have to ask is whether or not the speech is likely to cause immediate lawlessness, immediate violence. And so it's a very, very speech protective standard. But Schenck, again, stands for the proposition, free speech rights, even the rights we care most about, are not absolute. And real quick question about New York Times from Unionville High School. Um, could you compare it to Wiki, the WikiLeaks? Um, Cause yeah, I think, I think, I think it, impl it, it ends up implicating a similar set of issues. Cause I mean, yeah. in the end, it, 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 it comes back to, especially as we get closer and closer to modern day, the court takes more and more seriously. We want as much speech out there as possible. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think, I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, I thought so too. I was like, yeah, that pops into my head too. So the next three cases really look, and then I might sneak uh, Citizens United into this because I think it fits better here. Um, so I'll add on to these three. The next th three look at incorporation. So after the 14th Amendment, the um, 14th Amendment starts to lay out this idea that the Bill of Rights applies to the individual it like sticks to you like a shield, um, but that has to be done through incorporation. And the way we do it is through court cases. And what I, you know, you guys always talk about a selective incorporation, or I like to say just picking pieces as they go through each court case, what to stick to the individual to have these rights apply to you. So Gideon, Wainwright, Roe v. Wade, McDonald, Chicago. And then I'm just gonna toss in there, um, Citizens United, 
Because I think Citizens United might fit better with this grouping. Well, let's actually, I actually think Citizens United fits with the grouping we just you got went through it. because it's not, it's, it's, it has to do with the national We're moving government. this one so around. Yeah, no, so it's, it's not an incorporation case, but it's a direct First Amendment case. And nice. Citizens United, in the end, it, it, it's, it's about, so uh, Congress passed a law called the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, BICRA, if you really want to be fancy, is the, is the acronym. Um, and what, what it addresses, so the key part at issue in that case is that the, the uh, uh, Congress ends up banning uh, the use of either uh, corporate money or labor union money in expenditures for political campaigns. And so it bans those, it treats them differently than other sorts of money in politics. Um, and the challenge here was brought by a, an organization known as Citizens United. They had put together a documentary about Hillary Clinton criticizing her when Hillary Clinton was uh, uh, you know, seen as a potential presidential candidate down the line, and they said, no, 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 this, this act of Congress, it violates our First Amendment free speech rights, um, that this is core political speech, and that therefore, obviously, it's unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And with the Supreme Court, in a, in a five to four decision, said, Citizens United, you are right. In the end, that the, the speech of corporations, of labor unions in this context is protected. The congressional law violates those free speech rights, and as a result, the act must go. Um, and so this overturned a previous decision from the late 80s, but it ends up being a broad statement of sort of who counts as a political speaker in the American constitutional system. Um, and again, it's sort of a broad vision of uh, the restrictions on governments in terms of any the, sort of uh, in the powers of any government to res restrict spending that can lead to speech in a political campaign. And it's part of occurring a broader range of cases where we've seen the Supreme Court chipping away at different sorts of campaign finance reforms in a variety of different contexts over the last 20 years. Awesome, perfect grouping and I'll keep it there because I didn't like where it was. So, <laughs> so now into the incorporation cases and we can fly through these pretty quickly, but they're some of my favorites. Gideon um, versus Wainwright. How, what part of the Bill of Rights does this incorporate and say, all individuals must have this because that's what makes our system just and fair. So yeah, Gideon versus Wainwright has to do with the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. That's Clarence Earl Gideon right there. And he's in Florida. Um, and so in Florida, it's, it was one of the handful of cases at the uh, uh, states at the time that didn't provide counsel for someone in his situation. He was, um, uh, you know, he was, he was being tried on a felony count for theft in Florida. And so after representing himself in court, he was found guilty. Gideon appealed and he argued that the state's denial of attorney violated his Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And the court ultimately and unanimously agrees with Gideon. And, he find, and they find that the Sixth Amendment right applies to all criminal defendants charged with a felony in state courts, again, effectively extending the protection of the Sixth Amendment from what originally was applying only to the national government to now the state governments as well. And then Roe v. Wade, what part of the Bill of Rights does Roe v. Wade apply to the people? Because this one's a little bit trickier where it actually is in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, so, the, so Roe v. Wade is about this question of, are there rights in the Constitution that aren't specifically written in there that are protected anyway? It's what lawyers would fancily call unenumerated rights. But these are, these are let me first give the, the context. You know, you have a, a, a woman in Texas, Jane Roe, she was seeking, a, seeking an abortion. Texas had a law that banned abortions except when a woman's life was in danger. And so Roe challenges the Texas law, under, uh, arguing that it's unconstitutional under what a constitutional right to privacy. And so this is trying to apply a recent case at the time, Griswold versus Connecticut, which recognized the right to privacy and saying that it applies in the context of reproductive rights as well. Technically, it's falling under the Fourth Amendment's due process clause is where they're bringing this if you're looking for the textual hook. But the big question is, you know, are there, you know, one, are there rights that aren't specifically listed in the Constitution? And two, if so, what are they? And so here what the Supreme Court decides in a seven to two decision is that Jane Roe is right. There's a right to abortion that falls within the broader right to privacy and that the Texas law must go. Of course, I don't need to remind Ed, anyone that this remains a big topic of constitutional debate to today, both as to reproductive rights, but more broadly about how many of our rights, how many rights there are that exist that aren't specifically written into the Constitution. Awesome. Um, the next case is Chicago v. McDonald. So it's talking about the Second Amendment. Um, but is there a kind of lead up to this and how the Second Amendment is incorporated by the states? 
Yeah, so this is this is a a, a, a decision where you're it's a it's a person who owned a gun in Chicago pitted against the city of Chicago. Um, and the question here, there's a handgun ban in Chicago, and the gun owner here, Otis McDonald, is challenging it, saying it violates my Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. This case is a follow-up case to a case called District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008, where the Supreme Court ruled that there is an individual right to keep and bear arms in one's own home uh, for purposes of protecting your family. That case, because it was the District of Columbia, only applied to a federal territory and not a state. So for technical reasons, in Chicago, the court has to ask the, nat the natural follow-up question, which is whether the Second Amendment needs to be incorporated against the states. Um, and so whether that, the Second Amendment decision in Heller should apply in a case like McDonald when you're dealing with state and local governments. And the court says, yes. The court says, yes, we are going to incorporate the Second Amendment against the states. It's a right that is deeply embedded in our tradition in this country. And as a result of this, we are going to selectively incorporate it against the states. And so again, Curry, this is a, a demonstration that it's, it's a case by case process where the court's looking at distinct rights in the Bill of Rights and saying, does it apply against the states? Is it in a sense, it's really a fundament, fundamental na you know, national right that needs protecting against state abuses. Over time, we've incorporated nearly every right in the Bill of Rights. But as you can see, this case is 2010. We're still doing it in 2010. We've still done it over the last couple of years. There've been a couple of incorporation cases and still the third amendment, the seventh amendment protection of civil jury trials and the fifth amendment's grand jury rights still have not been incorporated. So, um, but the big, the big picture Curry is that over time what these cases have done and it was a big debate at the Supreme Court for a long time but it's really constructed a bill of rights that truly is a national charter of freedom applying not just to the national government but to states as well to everyone everywhere. Awesome. Love that. And so Tom, I'm going to keep you on a roll going to the 14th amendment. <laughs> so looking at equality, your favorite area, looking at the 14th amendment, we already did citizens United because it fits better with the first amendment cases. Brown versus board of ed is the big case that the AP government exam explores here and looks at equal protection. And one of their questions they have for the students is how important is the 14th amendment in protecting rights of citizens, which I feel like is an easy one, but a really good one too. Yeah, so Brown, in many ways, the most famous case in the history of the Supreme Court and rightly so. And so it's dealing with segregation in public schools. And so these are schools that are separately provided for African-American students and white students. It's part of the broader Jim Crow system, especially in the South, which is, which is discriminating against African-Americans and, and sort of separating African-Americans from white Americans in a variety of different contexts. Brown though, because it was public schools, it was seen as the big target. It touched so many communities everywhere. The argument here, it's students from schools across both the uh, sort of like the upper South and the deep South arguing that these laws, these laws separating white students from African-American students, they're unconstitutional. They violate the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. What the court has to determine here is whether or not to overrule an old case known as Plessy versus Ferguson which was a case from the late 1800s, which said separate but equal facilities for African-Americans and white Americans is okay as long as they're equal. And so the, the court here has to end up wrestling with that old case. And what the court says is ultimately the students are right. Segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong the day it was decided. Separate is inherently unequal. When we separate students out into different schools, it brands them with a sense of inferiority that undermines the equal, the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. Of course, those laws are unconstitutional. And a unanimous court said this with the decision by Chief Justice Earl Warren. And I think this is such an important case. And kind of the big ideas that the College Board wants to look at with these is how does the popular sovereignty play a fact into this? How do the people, and I love this picture because you really see who the people are in these cases um, and they're fighting for equality for all of us. And then also how the, there were all of these cases that you talked about Tom, all over the South, all kind of trickling up to the Supreme Court. And that was a huge strategy to change the law and to ensure equality through the 14th amendment. So it's not just what the 14th Amendment says, but all that work of even a six-year-old little girl to make that in to come into play. So big ideas there. Now, our la last two cases here, and then we have one case after it, is about representation. So equal representation, Baker v. Carr, the idea of 
one comes from one person, one vote. And then the idea of gerrymandering, which I know is very confusing for so many people across this country and a hot topic, uh, not just in 1993, but today. So do you want to dive into Baker v. Carr? Yeah, so Baker v. Carr is what's known, it's one of the reapportionment cases of the Warren court. And the challenge here, it's a bunch of Tennessee citizens going to court and saying, these district maps for the state legislature in Tennessee are unconstitutional. They deny our equal protection of, our, they, they, they deny the, they, um, they violate the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. What happened here is that Tennessee set up state legislative districts um, and then they didn't change them for over six decades. And so what this does over time is you have more and more people moving to cities, you have fewer people living in rural areas, and the state isn't updating the districts to reflect these changes in population. So a person's vote in rural areas counts for a lot more than a person's vote in urban areas. And so the court, what it said prior to Baker v. Carr is, this is uh, we're not getting in these cases. They're political, we're not gonna get into them, we don't have anything to say. But in Baker v. Carr in 1962, what the court says is, no, the challenges here are bringing a claim that we can decide under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And two years later, in a case called Reynolds v. Sims, the court does just that and says that, no, no, the rule is one person, one vote. We need districts to be redrawn so that everyone's vote is roughly equal. So that opens the door to these cases. And then exactly. what I would ask the students earlier this week was like, look at the map. Do these shapes look fair? So what is, what is the question, the constitutional question in Shaw v. Reno really getting at? Um, and also just really that pink thing looks like a salamander. Like what's going on here? Yeah, so this, this case brings up the, the, the question of uh, racial gerrymandering. So the big question here is, you know, what sort of limits on there when a court's drawing a new map like this, so these are different dis congressional districts in North Carolina, um, when, they, when, when the state's doing that, are there limits on how much it can take race into account? Is there a certain, one, can they take race into account? And two, is it possible they take race so much into account that it violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause? And what the court says here in a five to four decision is, yes, there, there, there are limits on uh, a state's use of race in drawing legislative districts. And that one of the things we're gonna look at is look at the districts themselves. If you have a really weird looking district like that, what we're gonna ask the state is, why did you draw it that way? In the order to survive a 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause challenge, the court needs a really, really good reason because the court's concerned here that, um, you know, one, states can use race, but they don't want race to be the predominant decisive factor in creating districts. They saw that as an Equal Protection Clause violation. So many of these cases remind me of math class and my math teacher saying to me, show your work. And like, it's almost like the courts over and over again and saying, if you're gonna do it, you have to show your work and so show your connection to your, the clauses. So our last mm -hmm. case kind of end with a big one that sets up judicial review and the, the, the role of checks and balances, the role of the judiciary and the classic case. So why don't you tell us about this as we wrap up and we're only eight minutes over. <laughs> All right, well, so, you know, Marbury v. Madison, it involves a lot of famous characters from John Adams, to James Madison, to Thomas Jefferson. And the facts are really, really complicated. I am not going to get into them. The big idea here though is that what John Marshall uses Marbury versus Madison to do is to affirm the core power of the Supreme Court. And so what, what he does in Marbury versus Madison is he strikes down a law passed by Congress as unconstitutional. And through that says that one of the roles we are going to have as a Supreme Court is the power of judicial review. And what judicial review means is that we are going to have the power to rule on whether a law passed by, by a government is constitutional or unconstitutional. This flows from the fact that we have a, a, a document, the constitution that everyone can read that was ratified by we the people. And that, that, root, that the, the fact that it was rooted in popular sovereignty and ruled by we the people, it is the, it is the supreme law of the land that we as a Supreme Court are going to, we will hear challenges and rule on whether laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. That's all that's happening in Marbury for all its fancy facts. I feel like uh, John Marshall kind of like mic dropped on this one. Like it's a huge mic drop case. Okay, students, so we just ran through those 15 big cases. Um, if you're taking AP Gov or if you're a future taking AP Gov, these are great court cases to know, to understand. 
and to see the interconnectivity between the cases and how the courts have spelled out kind of their work and their acts th through these cases. Tom, thank you so much for class today. Students, we will hang out after. If you have any follow-up questions, we will be here. If not, we will see you next time in class. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. The